Okay, I'm going to make a separate video now on something I first explored in part two of my Heathkit IM25 video, which was me messing around with trying to find a better way to make printed circuit boards at home. And I successfully made a board, but there were issues with uh, etchant permeating the toner that was being used as the etch resist. Although I did have very good luck with the toner transfer paper from Pulsar. So I still have my design here done in uh, Express PCB's free uh, circuit board design software. And instead of sending it out to that service for this because I don't need more than a couple of these, and it's a very simple one-sided board, uh, I'm going to just print that pattern onto this uh, transfer paper. Now the last time I did this I tried using my new HP Color Laser Jet because my old HP Color Laser Jet was the best printer I had for laying down the densest uh, black layer with the fewest gaps in it. And it doesn't seem like the, the new one is especially good at that. So I've decided to try just using my older HP monochrome laser printer first. So I'm going to start out with this here and I'm going to print it. And I'm going to select print bottom copper layer only. It'll be in portrait configuration. And I'm not going to print it to PDF here. I'm going to print it to my 2055 printer. And unfortunately, when you go through this software, it does not give you access to the printer dialog box. So I just printed this on paper to see what the pattern looks like. And it's really hard to tell if that's a denser layer or not. But I had previously saved to a PDF file, so hopefully it would allow me to print the pattern using the selected printer's print dialog box, which may give me more flexibility in print settings. So, with that in mind, I'm going to go here and try printing this one. And here it does give me my dialog box. I'm going to select the same printer I just used. Now, um, let's see what it has here. Uh, print on both sides of the paper. And it's selected to fit, which is not right. It has to be selected to actual size. And print grayscale, that is not selected. It doesn't have anything here about print density maybe under properties so let's see it's not here um, nothing obvious there paper quality paper and quality uh, there's nothing here it's not selected econo mode which I think would use less toner uh, the DPI, 600 DPI, should be fine. Um, effects. Nope. Finishing. That's for printing on both sides or rotating the image. Advanced. Let's see, maybe this will give me something here. Image color management. Document options, printer features. Print all text as black. Letterhead, raster compression. There is nothing here about setting the print density. So I'll just go back and print this here and well nothing meets the eye here but 
it looks a little thin when I hold it up to the light here. I can see gaps in the toner. And the one printed from the PDF is no better. I can actually see a lot of gaps in the toner here. So I get the special blue transfer paper and feed it into the color lasers manual slot. And go back here and select the color laser and print it. There it is. Unlike the last time I made this board design, I'm still going to uh, use my heat press to transfer the toner to the circuit board copper, but this time I'm going to follow that by using Pulsar's green TRF foil. They can't decide if they're calling it foil or film but uh, basically you lay this down, there's a dull side and a shiny side I guess, certainly a dull side. You lay this down over the toner image on the circuit board and then uh, apply the fusing process. And there's either a foil or a film that transfers to the toner, so instead of the toner being the etch resist, it acts more like a glue that holds down some of this material and the rest of it is supposed to peel off cleanly and then you can etch it and this materials a better etch resist than the toner is at least that's the idea now they're all about all their instructions are about doing this with um, their laminator which is like a plastic laminator you'd use to make uh, you know, laminate driver's licenses or, or ID cards or something. Okay, I've cut out the transfer paper just outside the line that denotes the edge of the final board. And you never want to touch this after printing it or before. It'll ruin the surface and the toner transfer won't work correctly. And I have a little piece of single-sided copper clad fiberglass board which I need to polish a little bit clean up and then I'll do the transfer alright here's my method for uh, cleaning the raw copper clad circuit board material this is just the way I get it when I buy packages of it I usually buy a whole stack of boards about this size they're big enough for most of my projects so uh, I get a piece of scotch bright. I use this brown color I don't know if it's color-coded or what. I would say it's a, a sort of a fine abrasive. Um, but um, I get it a little bit wet. And I put a dollop of the dish soap, or even the clear hand soap works. I get it somewhere where I don't have to hold it very much, like on the corner of this utility sink. And I start out by rubbing it along the edges. And I should say first that I go over the edges with sandpaper at an angle just to take off any burrs or raised spots in the metal from where it was cut uh, during manufacture. You don't want that stuff on there. It'll make the transfer paper... It'll make the transfer paper not lay down flat like it should. Or it'll... Um, possibly cause the heat press or the rollers on the laminator or something to, to not function as well as they should. You want to get the board free of any raised 
any raised edges. So I just go over it with this lightly soapy water in small circular patterns once I've gone along the edges. It doesn't need a lot of pressure here, just repetitions. That should be enough. Oops. Then I drop it on the bottom of the sink. That's an important step. Go over here and just inspect it. See if I missed any areas. See if it's nice and shiny everywhere. It looks like maybe I should give a little more attention to this edge. Yeah. Make sure it's good and rinsed. It doesn't do any good if you've got leftover soap on there. And of course there's always a little of the scotch brite pad that wears off. Ends up on the in the sink. And I get a uh, clean piece of paper towel. and just gently wipe it dry. Inspect it one more time to see if I missed any spots that look like they're not polished enough. And while I've got this damp piece of paper towel, I'm just cleaning up the sink from the residue of sanding the boards. Okay, I've got the two boards nice and shiny. The little hairline scratches from the Scotch-Brite sanding operation are inconsequential to what we're doing here. But you don't want to use any heavier abrasive because then the scratches might be consequential. And I want to make sure these are good and dry Boy, there's a lot of little spiders in this basement. Um, make sure they're good and dry, so I let them air dry for a couple minutes. Okay, I take my transfer paper and flip it over. Try to get it more or less centered on the copper. And I used uh, Kapton tape the last time, but I'm thinking it's a bit of an overkill. Um, I think I may just use some masking tape this time and see what happens. So I have the masking tape hanging over the edge so I have something to grip it by after transfer. Meanwhile, my heat press is on its way to uh, 270 degrees Fahrenheit. takes a few minutes to get up there and the timer is still set to 90 seconds which is what I used the last time and I'm gonna keep it that way this time. So I lay the circuit board with the transfer paper on the non-heated side of the heat press in other words with the back of the transfer paper facing up that's the part that needs to get the heat and um, then just because it's what I did the last time and what other people have reported seems to work best for them. I put a buffer layer down of a couple, well, just one piece of paper towel folded over. I can feel a lot of heat coming off the heated top side of the press. And we're still only about coming up on 220. I need to get to 270. Okay, we're up to 272, so I'm going to wang this guy down here, and the timer starts.
So now I just have to let that cool off. Now I just have a dish of water and I put this in there. And immediately we can see the foil pattern starting to show through. Should let it go for about a minute, I think. All right. We should be able to peel now. All right, looks like the transfer occurred all right. It looks very clean. I don't see any obvious gaps, so that's a good sign. Okay, this is the dull side of the TRF film or foil or whatever it is. It doesn't look much like foil to me. I think it's a film. Now the manufacturer um, Pulsar of the products I'm using really recommends the use of a, a laminator, um, plastic pouch laminator. I have a couple of these things. Uh, there's the GBC one I usually use. It's calibrated to the GBC products and therefore I have a better idea where to set it. I don't have to experiment. This one here is an older model. It's Korean but it's still made. I checked. It's like $160 to buy one new these days. It's the Tamerica uh, SM330, and it's actually one of the, the specific models that Pulsar says people have good luck with. It's one of their recommendations. So I'm going to try that, even though I kind of like the heat press better in many ways. Just, it seems like there'd be less things to go wrong, but I'm going to try to play the game the way the manufacturer of the products suggests. So the first thing they do is they actually have a tech note for this particular model on their website. It says, ignore all the manufacturer's instructions. Um, so I got to rotate the temperature knob fully clockwise. And I have to let the rollers heat sink for at least 20 minutes, even though the ready light may have come on saying it's up to the desired temperature. So I'm going to turn this guy on, and the ready light is not on yet because um, it's not up to the desired temperature. When I've got this turned all the way up to uh, 6, um, it's going to be at its highest temperature setting. May it, it may slow down the motor too, I'm not really sure, but once this light comes on I have to wait another 20 minutes. The product won't transfer properly, they say, unless you really let the rollers in here get fully and evenly heat saturated. Okay, the ready light is come on, meaning that the unit thinks it's at the desired temperature. And uh, I'm now supposed to wait at least 20 minutes, recommended 30 minutes, before doing the fusing. And they recommend. Um, laying it over with the dull side down and they recommend folding the front edge over and feeding it in and as soon as it comes in then grab the the rear and pull it slightly tight so there's no wrinkles I already see that there's wrinkles We'll see.
the instructions don't say anything about letting it cool off after it comes out so I'm just going to peel this off well this worked out a lot better let me uh, get where there's more light Yeah, this actually looks pretty good. There's a little glitch there, but that was in the toner transfer, not the green foil. That actually looks really good. That might actually be very successful. There's what the rear side looks like. That film is trash now. Let me do the other one. Once again, I'm going to line the foil up, with, or the film, I don't think there's any foil involved, line that up with the board, fold the leading edge under, got some wrinkles on this one at the beginning so that's not ideal but maybe it still worked properly Yeah, there's a little glitchiness um, down at this end, but it's still pretty good, and it's it's very good down at this end. So I've got two boards with the green film on top of the toner, and the toner looks good. Now it's supposed to be the green film that's actually the etch resist at this point, and the toner is just like the glue that's holding the film down. Now the other thing I'm going to try doing here is they have a whole treatise on different etching techniques on the website for Pulsar products and they say the contact etch, here's how to make a fast etch. The, they already covered uh, agitation and show that it takes way too long, that allows more um, undercutting and flaws in the etch resist to affect the quality of the copper and the bubbles is even bubbles are even worse for the bubble agitation tanks um, plus when the bubbles pop they spray the etchant all over the place um, so they say really the goal is to keep uh, etchant on the board but keep removing the old stuff is you know pretty promptly so the etching problem is completely solved with a sponge dis disposable gloves and an ounce or two of ferric chloride etchant. That's one or two ounces. There's no need for an etching tank, period. To prove to you how fast this works, go get a box of cheap disposable gloves and a soft sponge from your local drugstore and a small bottle of liquid ferric chloride from Radio Shack. These are all pretty old documents or from MG Chemicals, which is what I use. Um, so this is very fast and will demonstrate how powerful contact really is by merely wiping lightly over the board without without overlapping strokes you can etch a half inch half ounce copper board in about 45 45 seconds and a one ounce board in about two minutes simply throw on some gloves pour about an ounce or two of ferric chloride into the sponge and you're ready to etch they recommend using a thin sponge but the one they show is just the standard kind you'd get at any grocery store or drug store. I guess that constitutes a thin sponge. Um, the etchant will stay suspended in the sponge so you shouldn't get any drips. Uh, the sponge is going to get very black as the copper is etched off. Um, they claim that if you're on a sewer system the resulting metal is part of the treatment and you should be able to flush it down the drain. 
check with your local county and city water treatment facility, blah, blah, blah. Do not put down septic systems. So I'm going to try that on one of these boards. And if that doesn't work, I'm just going to go back to my normal uh, tub of etchant and agitation. That's two ounces. Get my MG Chemicals Ferric Chloride. And uh, just want to see how much they're actually talking about here. So, not too much. So, pour the etchant onto the sponge. Have to exercise the sponge a little bit to make it start absorbing the liquid. Let's see how this works. I should get my watch going so I can see how long this takes. Coming up on the minute. Okay, 416. I still don't think this stuff has gotten as soft as it's supposed to get here.
you know, I can see that uh, you can see the green there where there's no copper left that is going pretty speedily I'm going to flip the board around and work from the other side for a little bit. All right, let me rinse that off. Now for the other board here, I probably have enough ferric chloride in there, but I think I'm just gonna freshen it with a little dollop of additional ferric chloride. Just freshen the formula or the mixture up a little bit. Okay, I didn't actually time how long that other one was. Now it's going to be 22 and a half minutes. I'm turning the board over and working from the other direction. You can see it's mostly etched already. Okay, now to clean off the excess
problem with acetone is that it tends to mess up your nitrile gloves. Okay, there's the board. Hope if I get it right side up. Again, there's a little bit of a mess up on the transfer up in the text on the lower left corner. This part came out very nice. The foils all look pretty good. There's a little undercutting along the edges. But unlike when I did this before, for the uh, copper looks unetched everywhere where it's intended to be there. It looks much, much, much better. I'm quite happy with that. I still need to do a little more cleanup of these boards, but that'll be um, just before I tin them. So we've got some sort of success here. I like this etching method. It's not using up much uh, ferric chloride. It's pretty neat. There's no mess and minimal disposal issues. The sponge can be reused after it's wrung out in water. Um, so I'm gonna prepare the other two boards in the same manner. I need a total of four. Two for my remaining IM25 restorations and two for my IM16 restorations, uh, which I have two of. Uh, so, oh wait. You know, that's correct. I need a total of four boards and I've just made two. All right, I've got my patterns on the transfer paper, numbers three and four, out of the four I'm doing. Always want to make sure you never handle the blue side. I think that I get smeared text sometimes, like here, my black and white laser printer moves the paper through very quickly. And I think that may contribute to that on those really fine letters. I didn't get that with the color laser jet. But um, I didn't get good adhesion of the... Um, what am I trying to say here? I didn't get good adhesion of the green film when I was printing with the color laser printer. And they do actually caution against that in the technical notes from Pulsar. They say, um, in their experience, the color laser printers don't use the same kind of toner, and it's just not as good. Of course, by good, it refers to good for this application, not for normal printing, in which case I'm sure the toner is just perfect. But... Uh, And as I did before, it seemed to give perfectly good results doing two boards. And I didn't even use the paper towel over them. I don't know if that helped or hindered or was inconsequential. But I'm still at the requisite temperature here, so let's uh, wang this thing down and start counting for another 90 seconds. Okay, there's boards number three and four with the toner transferred. One of them came out really good. Um, there's a problem in the same area on both of them. It's like this little piece here, this diagonal piece, the toner's a little rippled, and here a little bit tore off. And um, I think that's the side I had taped. Um, probably I should have tried leaving this in the water just a little bit longer before I started peeling it off. It made the... Um, Dextrin or whatever it is, carrier might not have been completely dissolved there. Now for the green film. Same technique as before. Okay, both of those came out. There's some very fine wrinkling, but um, hopefully it won't make a difference. Let's see. And it came out looking pretty good. I 
Now that one area where the toner had lifted up a little bit, it's like it got pushed back down and the film helped flatten it. I think this one's okay. There are a couple little wrinkles in this trace right here. Yeah, there's, there are a couple little spaces where the uh, film did not lay down due to the wrinkles. Tiny little areas. And of course this area still is kind of thin. I think I'm going to put a touch of um, Sharpie marker there just to thicken that up a little bit. Boards number three and four after etching. Now for the acetone. Okay, I'm going to cut the boards down to size. Okay, time to tin the boards. I'm just going to be gutsy here and uh, do them all four at once and hope it turns out well. I have used liquid tin in the past, um, many years ago, and it seemed like it did an okay job. Uh, I think this is a better grade of it. Um, I think I probably used whatever one the Radio Shack or somebody was carrying. This is an MG Chemicals, their 421A liquid tin. So it just requires seven to ten minutes of immersion doesn't say to shake it or anything, so um, let's cross our fingers. Ah, it's got a safety seal. Stuff is pretty toxic, so um, don't really want to uh, get it on anything. I don't know if nitro gloves are as good as one should really have for handling this stuff. The label doesn't say anything about one kind of glove over another. You can already see that the uh, tin is adhering to the copper. So I'm going to wait 10 minutes and see how this turns out. Okay, it's been 10 minutes. And Okay, there's the plated boards. Now, they're not soldered, they're just tin plated. 
and uh, I think it's fairly normal for them to have kind of a a dull appearance. You know, it's not polished or anything. But uh, I'm going to drill the holes next, and uh, then after that, I'm going to go over it with some Scotch Brite, and those may shine up a little bit. But it's supposed to be pure tin, so it should solder well, regardless of whether it's shiny or, or dull in appearance, I would think. Okay, I've got my handy dandy drilling chart. There's really only a few sizes of holes, all the ones with the orange highlight are 0 .03 approximately. They can be a little bit larger, but they shouldn't be smaller. The ones in the blue are 0 .02. Uh, the one in the violet is uh, 0 .035. Uh, the one in the black is 0 .04. There's another 0 .035 set up here. And then the two big holes for mounting are 0 .128 which is a number 30 drill. Now, um, since the prototype of this series of boards, I purchased this on Amazon at a quite a low price. They are um, <laughs> little tiny drill bits with uh, kind of a confusing holder. They're color-coded, but there's nothing that comes with it to say which sizes these things are. I don't see anywhere on here where it says, but there might be something. Anyway, they're supposed to be chuckable in a Dremel tool, or at least the shank is large enough to not require a, an especially small chuck in a regular drill. And I think these are carbide tip. They're not especially long-lifed cutting through fiberglass, but for stuff like I've got, hopefully they'll be good. Um, you have to make sure you don't break these things when drilling them. But uh, I'm going to try to just hand drill these with the Dremel tool rather than use the drill press and see how it goes. If I'm snapping off drills left and right, I'll start using the drill press. I have here my Dremel 2050, which is just a micro-sized, um, it's not even AC powered in the normal sense of the word, it has a, a wall wart, um, but it's fairly inexpensive and I like it for things like this just because it's very comfortable to hold for small things where you want to get into tight spaces and what have you, and you don't have all the weight of the bigger Dremel tools. And so I've confirmed that these little bits do chuck up into the normal Dremel chuck. They're the same diameter. Now it's too hard to hold it steady this way. It's skating around, so I'm going to go back to the drill press.
I just did a sanity check uh, for this first size of hole to make sure all the components did fit in that size of hole. And now for the mounting holes. These drills aren't so tiny and they just come out of my regular drill index. Now to open these up. Oh, that's a wobbly drill. Okay, completed boards without components yet, of course. Um, I just went over them very lightly with the Scotch Brite, and it did brighten up the the tin plating. Now the the plating is quite thin, even though I left it sitting in there for ten minutes. You can almost see a little pinkishness right in the middle there. Maybe not in the camera, but I can see it uh, where I started to wear through the the tin a little bit. This one came out pretty good. This one I was overzealous. And again, I don't know if the camera will register it, but pretty much this whole area is pinkish in real life because I've cut through uh, more of the plating than I should have with overzealous scotch braiding. But it's still got a lot of uh, tin on it. It's just. Um, not as much as there should be, so you can start seeing through it a little bit. Anyway, so um, you can probably see here the pattern. There's no holes in the lower right because these two are for IM16s and they only need one battery eliminator. So I don't have the holes drilled for the parts I'm not going to use. And then this has got all the holes in it for both sides of the circuit. For the IM25, um, the 3 volt and the 1.35 volt supplies. So, assuming that the solder adheres to this tin plating properly, I would call this a success. I uh, predict that this will be the method I use to make circuit boards at home now. It comes out pretty neatly, and uh, I'm happy with the results, even though I did have to burn through a whole pack of the blue toner um, transfer paper doing experiments that many of them failed. And I have to use both the the heat press for good toner transfer as well as the laminate uh, um, the pocket laminator for the uh, for the green film. I couldn't get just one machine to do both properly. Okay, I'm going to use two of the boards I made to build up the dual battery eliminators for the IM25s. And I'm still waiting on my DigiKey order that has the parts for the 
battery eliminators for the IM16s. Same parts, just more of them. And uh, those were supposed to be delivered today, but their tracking shows them not being close by here. So at least I'll make hay while the sun shines and build these up. Low profile components, resistors, diodes, and jumpers. Diode bridges and trim pots. Capacitors. Voltage regulators and heat sinks. Alright, board assembly complete. All that's missing is the input and output wiring. The soldering went just fine. There was no problem with my tin lead solder flowing and adhering to the um, tinned copper. Went on very nicely. Got 1.35 volts right where I expect it. And up here I've got my 3 volts working perfectly. All right, total success. These have been powered up and tested and calibrated.